who are going to give us some of their own um, experience, share some of their own experience. Um, I am going to pass this off for a moment to Dean Page, who um, who joins us for almost all of these sessions. We're so appreciative of his support. And I asked him specifically uh, today to give us an idea of what his own path to leadership was, lest we leave his rich experience on the table. So Dean Page, I'm gonna hand it off to you for a moment. Thank you very, thank you very much. And, and uh, greetings to everybody. Um, um, indeed, I, I come to all of these in part totally selfishly because I learn every time. Uh, but I also want to uh, want to support you and, and everybody putting these together as, as such a great asset we have for our college and beyond. Um, briefly, in terms of kind of leadership path, uh, in some ways, mine looks very linear. Assistant professor, associate, full chief of cardiology, chair of medicine, dean. I mean, that's in a nutshell. There was no rhyme nor reason to exactly what I was going to do. I didn't have any idea. Life changes over time. Um, I will make comment about a couple of things. One is is for you to look for opportunities to lead. Um, I suddenly became a chief of cardiology, and I had no training. I took a certificate in medical management that was really valuable to me, and we have opportunities here through partnership of Jason and myself for for physician leadership as well. Um, and the other thing I'll just mention, and this is a term that I learned from one of these, one of these meetings a few years back is, is allyship. Um, uh, looking out to who's doing something that you might want to do and asking for advice and looking for people to be an ally, whether you're a woman or a man, but looking for, um, for opportunities and sharing with people that that I'm looking for, for your being an ally, a mentor, a guide, almost everyone will say yes. If you happen to run across a jerk, don't let that dissuade you. The next one will want to be your ally and friend and mentor and to keep looking for opportunities to learn from others who have done things that you might wanna be interested in. So those are the, the idea of getting some technical training, whether it's learning books, whatever, or ideally coursework in terms of, of leadership and, and having allies, friends, mentors who are looking out for you and giving you advice as critical as you. We need more leaders, so please don't be dissuaded. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. And now I look forward to listening to others. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dean Page. Um, allyship is um, so important, and we certainly feel in the Gender Equity Initiative true allyship um, from you and from other leaders in the organization, um, which makes us all more successful. So thank you. Um, a couple of um, nuts and bolts, businessy things. Um, please subscribe to the Gender Equity Listserv. Um, Emily's going to put that link in the chat for everyone. Um, also, um, Emily has put in a link for the live captioning, um, if that's uh, something that makes this session um, accessible to you. Um, and then the final thing is uh, December 13th is our next session. It will be uh, in an in-person networking lunch uh, around the topic of everyday leaders. This is, this is the concept of um, folks le truly leading but without having a formal leadership title. And we all know those folks in our spaces um, that are leading without being asked to lead, without having protected time to lead. And we'd actually love if you have one of those people working in your space, we'd like to recognize that person. Um, so Emily is gonna put in, or she already has put in, um, a link to a Qualtrics survey where you can just, all you do is click the link, put the person's name in, um, and then we'll get in touch with them um, and say, someone in the organization recognized you as an everyday leader. Would you help us teach more about what that means? Um, so paths to leadership. Um, this is a great panel discussion. Um, we have some excellent panelists who I'm going to um, introduce in in a in a moment i i will um well let me go ahead and introduce them um first we have um in alphabetical order 
Um, Beth Kirkpatrick, who is professor and chair of microbiology and molecular genetics um, and director of the Vaccine Testing Center. Thanks so much for being with us. Deborah Leonard is professor and chair of pathology and laboratory medicine. Thank you. And uh, Jason Sanders is um, Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, President and CEO of the Medical Group and Network Executive VP for Clinical Affairs. So thank you all for volunteering your time. Um, I will also just call out loud that uh, before we open this up to the audience, we made an agreement that, um, that we would use first names here in, in, this, uh, in this space. Um, so you'll hear us calling each other by first names. And now I just wanna, I'm gonna pass it along to each one of these panelists. And with the question of why, what's your why? Why are you a leader? And so I'm gonna start with uh, Beth and we'll just go around in a circle. Hi. Well, thank you, Anne, and thanks for asking me to be on this panel. It's uh, it's really a huge pleasure, and um, welcome to everyone. It's great to see so many people here. Um, so I, you know, I think I would never use the word leadership if someone said, "What do you do?" I don't think I'd ever say, "Well, I'm a I'm a leader." Um, I think I my purpose and motivation is I'm I'm very committed to the sort of academic medical center mission of clinical care research, education, and service. And I think as your career goes on, you sort of find yourself really being more and more willing to help facilitate that mission, sort of maybe even above and beyond what you might personally be interested in. And I, I feel like my motivation is to make this system work. Um, I really enjoy working with uh, people in the administration. Uh, I, I love the faculty and I, I like to make their job easier. I'd like to... Uh, help them navigate their careers. And I like to really be in the complexity of how this whole um, organization works and facilitate it in any way I can. And I, that brings me a lot of, lot of joy. So I think um, those are my purpose and uh, motivation sort of in, in a nutshell. Great, thank you so much, Beth. I'm gonna pass it along to Deborah. Oh, I echo. Thank you for um, including me in this panel. It's qu quite an honor. Um, it's interesting because as a pathologist, you're thrown into being a leader pretty early on in your career. I was, I was the leader of a laboratory section in my first position. So um, it's sort of a natural succession, similar to what Dean Page described of, you know, being a section medical director to being a vice chair to being a chair. Um, my motivation, my why, um, even though, you know, I had to do it without understanding why I was doing it, is really um, why I continue to want to move to higher level leadership roles is to make the world of academic medicine a better place for those who are underrepresented or non-majority groups. I, I, um, I learned early on that I got very angry with the way women were treated. So I came at this from my own experience as a woman being called names for being successful. And, and so uh, it motivated me to be chief diversity officer at Wild Cornell Medical College and then to seek a chair position because with higher and higher, if you want to call them higher or larger sphere leadership roles, you really have a larger influence. And now as a chair, not only the influence of my over my department or on my department, but also influence at the institutional levels. Thanks so much for that, Deborah. And we've had many conversations, you and I, about spheres of, of influence. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Jason, your why. Thanks. Well, thanks again for including me. Uh, much appreciated. My first why is I generally look at life as a gift and it goes by quickly. Uh, my second why is I really enjoy being a part of organizations and communities that are gonna be enduring, uh, that will continue on far past my own lifetime. 
specifically in healthcare, uh, my why is being inside academic health systems such as ours and working to innovate from the inside versus from the outside. Excellent. And I'll just um, uh, underscore that if folks want to put questions in the chat, you can go ahead and do that at any time um, and we'll answer them as appropriate as we go along. And we're going to leave plenty of time for audience questions in the second half. And um, because we're in a meeting format, you'll be able to raise your hand and, and ask your question or you can keep it in the chat. Um, as well. Um, you can also use the Q&A if you'd like to put in an anonymous um, question, um, and then we're happy to read those out. Um, so paths to leadership, um, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, Rick told us a little bit about his own um, path to leadership. Um, I'm going to mix up the order a little bit and start with Deborah. What was, what was your path to leadership? And I guess part of that is did you know when you were graduating from medical school that you were on a leadership trajectory? Was that was that something that was predetermined um, in your head or an idea that you had? Well, well, the, the answer for that one was a big no, um, because basically I um, I'm first gen college, let alone medical school. So um, I didn't really understand academic medicine. And so my path was I, a lot of failures along the way, which people don't really talk about, but I find is very helpful to talk about uh, not getting into medical school out of uh, college, failing my boards the first time I took them. Maybe that's not something I should admit because Jason and uh, Rick could uh, fire me for that. But I think, uh, you know, so there, there are failures along the way. Um, but my... Um, uh, my path was really, so no, when I became a faculty member, I wasn't thinking about leadership other than leading the, the section, the laboratory that I was director of. And at that point, I was a single parent with two kids as a starting assistant professor. So it, it was very challenging. Leadership was not something I was thinking about. Um, and, and so I, I really came to appreciate leadership um, when I, I joke that I learned most about what I wanted to do as a chair by knowing what I did not want to do that the chairs I had worked under had done. So um, it took me a while when I became a chair to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, so I think I decided I wanted to be a chair though as an assistant professor and I knew little enough about the academic medical system that I didn't know you had to be a professor to be a chair. And I was actually one of two finalists as an assistant professor for a chair position, but I didn't get it. Um, so um, I, I guess I, I've always wanted to um, do more, have more responsibility, have a bigger sphere of influence. So, you know, once I understood leadership pathways, then I began to, to figure out how to move along the pathway to be successful at higher, higher leadership roles or larger and larger. I hate to use the hierarchical kind of system. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. And I, I also I, I also hear um, talking about failure um, and maybe we'll get to this um, a little bit further on in our discussion, but I. I think it's so important for everyone that's coming along that we own our own failures um, and 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 give voice to them rather than putting them in a dark corner somewhere and pretend like we're all we're all perfect. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I I appreciate that, um, and we I think we'll come back to that. Um, let's see. Um, how about um, Jason? I'm going to talk about your path to leadership and and when it's when it sort of sparked an interest like oh I would like to 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 be the leader of this group or that group. Glad to share. So the first thing I'd say is that uh, I saw changes that I wanted to happen that weren't happening, and I thought why not? Um, so 
being the change uh, that I wanted to see. Uh, I also got more comfortable taking risk, um, just stepping forward into things, um, give things a try. I know one of my college professors had reached out uh, in my senior year. I'd gotten uh, married that summer and it had come back and uh, I knew then that uh, when I got to medical school, that one of the feedback I got was not to forget to turn in the applications is getting late, but they mentioned another opportunity and said, you know, why don't you try? And I went through that process and uh, I really realized that I had something to contribute. Uh, so taking risk, I'd say within healthcare specifically in my training in medical school, I really saw physician leaders that really stood out in a number of different positions and they had the same feedback of, okay, fine, go make it happen. You know, I'd bring to them an issue and they'd say, okay, what are the, you know, they, what are, what barriers can they take? Uh, can they address for me? But otherwise you should just go forward and try to make the change happen. Um, and then formally uh, during medical school, I decided after I started to do uh, a joint MBA at the same time as the MD uh, because I thought that some of the information would be helpful. Um, and I know it's one of the later questions. I think there's a lot of ways to go about it, um, but as uh, talented as physicians and healthcare providers are, uh, you can pretty quickly pick up some fundamentals that'll help just accelerate what you, whatever change you wanna make happen. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. And so just as a follow-up, Jason, did you, was, was your path similar to Rick Page's, similar to Deborah's, in that you went from assistant to associate to full professor to division chief to and 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 on like that? Uh, no, uh, I've taken a different path. Um, so going back to training, actually, um, after college, uh, I really was passionate about the history of illness, present illness and patient narratives. Uh, so I went off and did an English degree actually overseas. Uh, and then when I came back to, I just was passionate about it. And then when I came back to medical school, I, I mentioned the joint MBA, and then I actually did my internship year. And after internship, they did healthcare consulting. And then after that, went back and, and completed my training. And, and along the way, people were supportive. Um, but it was really what was standing out to me that consulting was around the time of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so I was really interested in that change in policy and working with both healthcare delivery organizations and others uh, as that approached. And then after uh, completing residency and a couple opportunities, but in the spirit of taking risk, uh, I, uh, I grew up in Oklahoma uh, and I had left uh, several years ago. Uh, and I've gotten calls over the years about various things, uh, but I got some calls around that time um, that and that this was the university president who, who shared several of their challenges and said, you know, I just, there's these challenges, we haven't solved them. Some of them hadn't been solved for 10, 15 years. And, you know, here's here's an opportunity if you want to take it. Uh, and so I, I chose that to give back to the state where I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, I was there for a number of years, but uh, not to go into details, but it's a fairly non-traditional path. I was driven by, the last thing I'll say, when I got there, I could see the problems and I, I went about leadership, how I spent my time of like, what can I do to solve that problem? So it wasn't a linear path. That's great. Thank you for adding the, the, the squiggles, the squiggles or the meandering uh, uh, path. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Beth, tell us about your journey in leadership, not leadership. I know you said in the <laughs> beginning, that's, that's maybe not the, the word that you identify with explicitly, but tell, tell us your, your path to where you are right now. Yeah, so I'm trained as a, a clinical infectious disease physician, right? And I'm now I'm a chair of a basic science department. So um, I think I, you know, I had no idea, I, just to be honest. And as a medical student, as a even as a resident, 
Um, you know, I had no idea how any of these systems work, an academic medical center work, a hospital work, no, no idea, really until I became a chief resident. And then I think you're put in this position that you are now given this administrative leadership role over the residency and you start understanding, you know, the, all the infrastructure and the systems and the policies and how everyone interfaces with them. You know, and for me, then I had a real desire to understand enough of how all this worked to be able to start making changes or connecting the hierarchy. Um, and I think that's sort of where I landed when I became a faculty member. And soon after starting as basically a full-time clinician, I started building the vaccine testing center. And so while building that, I'm sort of learning, like, how do you run an organizational structure, hire people, lead a team, get research awards, and that's sort of growing on the side. I, I, was in the, I was in the dean's office as an associate dean for clinical research for not long, a couple of years. Um, I ended up taking the ELAM course, which we can talk about later. Deborah also did that, sort of a full year academic leadership course. Um, I took the mini MBA that Fletcher Allen used to, or to, to give. I, so sort of filling in some of these gaps and starting to understand sort of more systematically why I was doing what I was doing and how to sort of be better at understanding how the system worked in an academic place with academic missions and how to be better at that. Um, and so when the opportunity to run this department came up, um, you know, I'm not uh, as basic of a science as my a scientist as my faculty are, but I certainly know enough about microbiology and uh, academic research um, that I felt comfortable taking this role. So that's where I that's how I got where I got. And it wasn't a very, it was a was it a linear route? Not exactly linear. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. Um, but that's my that's my backstory. Yeah, I I I feel like you are you're led by your passion for the the work that you're doing. You're you're led by the passion for developing vaccines, for doing the research, for doing the patient care, and then I heard you say, sort of learning these other skills that are the leadership skills almost uh, as like an ancillary thing. Um, is that, do you think that's, that's Yeah, accurate? and I think, you know, leadership to me, I feel like maybe this makes me sound like the Pied Piper a little bit. And I feel like it's not a solo job. I cannot tell you how dependent on the administrative team I am and the other leaders in my department. And I don't make all the decisions. I, you know, I have a, a teams of very smart, motivated, independently thinking people. And so I guess, you know, for me, the leadership sounds too individual. And I feel like this is leadership or whatever we're calling it is really a team sport. So I, I guess I'm not, you know, I'm not objecting to the term leadership, but I feel like it maybe gives too much credit to a single person who really is just, you know, orchestrating the rest of the crew, I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for adding that. Um, Bruce, can you bring all four of us back onto the screen, and then we'll we'll go through some of the some of the other questions that I have. And and, and I think building on what Beth had talked about, um, one of my questions was, what is one thing that you wish people understood about leadership, or what or what like myth do you want to debunk or what truth do you want to do you want to spread and put out there into the ether and i'll go with whoever yes deborah so i i would like to suggest that you can lead from any position so many people depend like you're saying next session you're going to honor leaders who don't have titles so leadership is not about a title. A title may give you, you know, a better definition of your sphere of responsibility and someone is going to be holding you accountable no, no matter what leadership position you're in. You always have a boss, you know. So, um, you know, I, I think that any of us can be can be leaders. And so I, I think learning about leadership, that it's not about it's not about power. It's really about setting a vision and then influencing or motivating people to march toward that overarching vision and not getting too um, engaged in all the details. Building a leadership team, as Beth said, um, 
the prior chair in my department basically was the leader of the department. And I have a group of about eight people who I lead with now, and they have their own leadership groups. So I've been, you know, I've, I've, I, I think there's a shared leadership model that can be used um, in being a leader. I don't know if that answers your question, Anne, but. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, any, Jason or Beth wanna add anything, Jason? So two things, one, similar as Deborah said, I think people are ready to lead before they think they're ready or others may recognize that they're ready. So I'd really encourage everyone, uh, especially in healthcare because the training is, is so long. So I think people are ready before they think they're ready. And the other thing was with leadership, uh, in some ways you can simplify it because I think a lot of the thoughts are about the process uh, uh, and that can, there's importance there, but if you just think about the outcomes and it can be just one thing you wanna achieve or maybe a couple of things you wanna achieve, then everything else can fall into place. And you can also communicate your leadership to others more easily. Of, I am trying to help the organization achieve this thing and, and so forth. So ready before people think they are and more on outcomes and process. Yeah, Beth. Um, I guess uh, what I would like to, to add is that, you know, I think some of the times the appeal of a leadership position feels like, you know, very powerful. But I would say, and I would be interested in Jason and Deborah's opinion on this, is the, the position of authority comes with the commensurate responsibility. Um, and that can be a big burden. And so it, you know, you bear a significant responsibility for what you're responsible for. Um, and that can be a big weight. I mean, so, and I think you want people in these roles that feel that weight. Um, and so the buck does stop with you. And so it can be quite intense to be a leadership in a leadership role because there is a lot of responsibility um, and, uh, and, and the sort of uh, weight that comes with you know, being the one is, that's responsible for these things. So I just wanted to say that, you know, it, it's not always, you know, necessarily fun every day because there are a lot of big things that people are depending on you to help them with. Um, and that that comes with the territory. So that'd be, be something when you, when you sort of step into this role, you sort of try it on and you say, how does this feel? And, um, and then you'll kind of know where you want to level out with the position you want, because you do have to, be able to function in a role in which you bear a lot of responsibility. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll open it up to Jason and Deborah. How, how do you cope with that, with that weight and that responsibility? Well, it's interesting because one of the questions in the chat was, um, how do you, um, find uh, balance or something like that. How do you take care of yourself? I forget what the promote work-life balance. Yeah. I, I've, um, I've said for a very long time, I don't think there is work-life balance. There's work-life integration. You, you know, your personal life will go up and then your work life goes up and you hope they don't both go up at the same time or the seesaw breaks. <laughs> so um, it, it's really, um, and someone else asked, how do you take care of yourself? Um, I didn't take care of myself. Um, I, 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 uh, I have learned to do that. Um, but as long as I had kids in the house, um, there was way too much to do. And society looks at women as being the primary, you know, home person. I think many women, um, I found up here in Vermont have um, partners uh, who are the primary home provider, if you will, which actually creates a lot of um, room for women to take consider and take on leadership roles and extra responsibility. Um, it, it, it was I actually found it was more stressful earlier on in my career than it is now as a leader. At first, when I became a chair, 
there was a lot of things to do. And I was, as I said before, I knew what I didn't want to do, but what I did want to do wasn't quite as clear. So figuring that out uh, took some time. And then building a leadership team where we trusted each other, where there could be transparency. Um, those were all things that I had not experienced before from a chair. My chairs were all um, not transparent. Leadership positions would be announced and I didn't even know that they were looking for someone to do that. Salaries and finances were not shared openly. So lear learning to be comfortable with transparency was something I had, I had to do. Um, because there's this concept that the chair is powerful. One of the things I struggled with was that my title walked into a room before I did. And so people are scared of me even before they know me, just because I'm a chair. And, and that's hard to realize and reconcile with and to overcome to let them know that you are a person, that you, you know, have, have a, a personal life and you care deeply about them and you want to help them um, get getting all that past that your title is, it takes time to do that. Anything you want to add, Jason, to the 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 weight the weightiness of leadership and the way to integrate i think it connects to the why so it's so important for me that the institution the college the university the health system endures and meets its mission and so i think i take every challenge in that circumstance um and uh the team that you work with uh when you confront issues. So I've confronted challenges in GME, I've confronted challenges in research funding and clinical care, uh, front news, uh, front page news stories. I think all that in the context of really believing that the academic health system I'm a part of is important. Um, someone needs to step up uh, with the challenge and you can always address it better with the team. Uh, and also, oftentimes with all of our challenges, we don't realize the support we have at times. Uh, so mobilizing that support. So that that's some of the facing the the responsibility and, and challenges. Uh, last thing I'll say is I never worry alone. Uh, I think I got that uh, on one of my earlier lumbar punctures, uh, and it's always stayed with me. Uh, and I, I face challenging situations that way as well. Uh, Never worry alone. I like that. Never worry alone. Um, and it goes back to the teams that I think both Deborah and Beth have talked about also, right? Surrounding yourself by talented people who are doing the job alongside you. Um, I, you know, Deborah, you a couple of times have have brought up um, women in leadership roles and challenges, particularly for women or for folks who are marginalized. And this is the Gender Equity Initiative. Um, so, so I wonder about how you, as a leader, um, bring a sense of um, inclusivity um, to your to your team, to your sphere of influence, and um, you know, and and particularly for maybe for you, Jason, who are who are leading a team here, and then also uh, leading an, a a larger group and organization. How do you make sure that 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 this sort of sense of um, equity and inclusion? permeates through the organization. So so how do you how do you do it on your on your smaller team, make sure everyone's being supportive and it's an it's an inclusive and diverse team and how do you make sure it permeates through? And we can say we can start with anyone. Okay, you called me out to begin with. Um, I was going to call on you if, you if no one said anything. So Okay, Thank good. You. So um, my, my journey of um, 
my DEI journey basically started from a perspective of realizing that I was being um, passed over for leadership. I was not being considered as a leader. Um, and, you know, that that was a rude awakening for me because my mother had raised me telling me over and over again, you can do whatever you set out to do. You just have to, you know, set your mind to do it and work hard and you'll get it. But she didn't grow up in academic medicine <laughs> um, <clears throat> where there are many biases. So I think having experienced those myself, which is within the academic medicine setting, not necessarily in society, I, I gave me a little bit of insight in what it might be like to be BIPOC, although experiencing those things, not just in academic medicine, but in life in general, um, the biases that are against you. Um, it, it was, um, I, I, I it, as part of my strategic plan, not mine, but the team's strategic plan for the department when I first started, we, we had um, a people first council um, with a vice chair for eventually evolved into culture and inclusion, a vice chair for culture and inclusion. So that's been integral to my department from the beginning is um, defining what our common values are that include diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and holding people accountable for living our common values. Um, so like I did it slightly differently than Rick Page did with a professionalism statement, um, but we had how I expected people to behave that was based on information I derived from everyone in the department of the values they thought we had and our aspirational values, and then um, expanded that to really be education in, so my own education path then I constantly am learning new frameworks of the world. Because I think a very important aspect of leadership is being able to see the world from the other person's perspective. And you only do that, I, I do that partly by traveling and, and seeing lots of other cultures, but also by reading, by talking with people and being open to feedback or their perspectives or wanting to learn from them. Um, so, um, I, I just think it's very important to have people feel included. I'm just finishing, um, a study. I'm doing a poster at AAMC on looking at the characteristic, asking the question simply, can women achieve gender equity as defined by, you know, achieving the same number or percent of women full professors in departments and about a third of pathology departments who responded to a survey have done that. And looking at the characteristics of those departments, there are much higher percentage of women chairs, a much higher percentage of women in the department, higher percentage of leaders as a percent of faculty. So just that's like a shared leadership model. So it's interesting to think about how you can more broadly create an inclusive environment in a department. I'd be glad to share a few thoughts. Thank you. And this is very important uh, for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, so the first thing I'd say is the time is now, or at least look at every situation and say, why not now? Uh, just go in with that assumption that now is the time for change, uh, unless there's a compelling reason not to, and there's just a limit and limit that. I think we need to create more leadership opportunities that also accelerates the change. If you look just at some of our roles in a hierarchical structure, um, there are some limitations on titles and roles, but I think there is significant leadership opportunity across all of our missions. And so broadly defining that, I think it's important uh, for leaders, uh, all genders, um, to define in their CV what they have done as they do it and as mentors work with them. So uh, even if there's not a title, uh, a project and an outcome, uh, and I think as we look at positions uh, for hiring, 
to look at CVs in that manner versus just the titles. Um, sometimes we get to the title and then the responsibilities, but to really now say, I worked on this for six months or two years or in parallel. Um, and it, we do a kind of a time allocation as well, which is hard if you think of a female assistant professor and we're looking at the allocation of time and we, we have it in kind of a quantified manner of, okay, we do it in decimal points, as you know, of, uh, 0.1 or 0.3, uh, and that has the, the risk of kind of boxing in the work and, and thinking more about what are the outcome that we want to see, what's your role in it, how do we support you, and even just saying before we started, you know, what well, this? how do we want to describe this at the end of it, kind of like you imagine a few years from now, someone reads an article about whatever you're doing, what do you want them to say and celebrate, and just start from that at the beginning and, you know, let's make it happen. Uh, we have to be very intentional uh, with every position to post it, unless there's a reason not to, uh, and then limit and limit the reasons not to, to post it so people can step forward. And when we post it, utilize networks, um, particularly uh, mentors who say you should step forward. Uh, I think as we go through the posting for positions, even the way we write the position descriptions, there's still some uh, either requirements or expectations um, that we could make more flexible um, just because we don't know if someone's taking a nonlinear path, they can be very compelling for it. So not, not to restrict from the beginning. Um, and that differs across the mission, uh, certainly in some of our academic positions, um, there's a fair number of viewpoint that, you know, maybe there are some things that you need to do beforehand, it's hard, but the, just the more flexibility I think creates more opportunities um, as we go through a search uh, or just on the teams you work with. I know that's part of the question. I think being very deliberate to make sure everyone on the team has a chance to share their opinion. Um, because if we don't go around and, and someone has been quiet for the first 20 minutes and say, what do you think? They don't engage. We need them engaged for the impact. And then uh, on a search community to hear everyone's voice. Um, but I think bottom line, the time is now, unless otherwise, uh, there's a lot of talent, a lot of work to do, uh, college, university, health system. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I think networks are really important. Um, in my previous system, uh, the mentorship, uh, particularly among female faculty and leaders was tremendously powerful. Uh, and it, especially as you think about working across silos. So as someone, I, uh, one dean I hired um, was, had been in one college and a dean position came up in another. Her background uh, wasn't the traditional pathway, but uh, you know, I heard through the network in an open posting uh, and then she was very successful in the process and then was appointed dean. And so making some of those shifts or whatever your area is, um, I think that mentorship network can be really powerful. Thank you. Um, if anyone has questions from the audience, please feel free to raise your hand um, or put questions into the chat. Um, as we... Anne, could I speak to one of the questions, which is how do yes, you, you model work-life balance in your own lives? Yeah. I started uh, that as a, as a vice chair in that I had a son who was on the varsity basketball team. And I would leave at three o'clock whenever he had a game to go all over New York City, wherever the game was, and modeled not measuring your commitment to your job by the time that you were visible at work, but really by what you accomplished. And I've modeled that also as a as a chair. I don't have children to go to their games, so I you know, but um but leaving when I need to leave, um, I, I think it's very important for leaders to model not necessarily working 24-7, 365. You have to have periods of time when you work very hard, but then um, balancing that with, with times when you take time off for yourself and your family. And also, I've learned to exercise. I've always pretty much, well, actually, I, I was going to say I've always eaten pretty well, but my current husband, my husband says that I had a healthcare provider diet when I met him, which was 
a cup of coffee and a muffin for lunch and peanut butter, I mean, for breakfast and peanut butter crackers for lunch and then hopefully something healthy for dinner. So I do a little bit better than that now, but it's very, very hard when you're junior and you have um, a young family, if you, if you choose to do that. Yeah, and I would I would add that one of uh, one of the leaders that I worked under that I respected the most was the person who had very high expectations, knew everyone was showing up to work to work really hard and probably at 150 percent. But if I needed to leave to go to a parent teacher conference, never asked a question. Oh, if if I had family in town and needed to switch the call schedule, never asked a question. And I and I really respected that um just that that trust that the work was gonna get done. If he needed me to do something, my answer 99.9% .9 of the time was gonna be yes. Um, and that there was no need to nickel and dime about the leaving at three o'clock to go do something that was important for the family. Because basically what goes around comes around. Everybody is going to have the need to take time for their family or you do have to, you know, monitor that someone is not, not working because then you have to have a different discussion. But generally almost a hundred percent of people are very, very dedicated and, and very committed to their work and to our patients. Um, and to our colleagues. So um, it's good. Great. Um, we do have some questions from, from the chat. One of them um, is, do current, I'll, I'll read it as it's written, do current medical leaders have maximum length they can practice before handing over the reins to trained younger staff? And I think sort of maybe embedded in that question is, should leadership roles have term limits to them, um, how do you ensure that the next generation of leaders is making the progress into X, Y, or Z role? And I'll leave that open for anyone. When I can start and others can jump in maybe, <clears throat> I don't know that there's term limits per se, but I think there are, you know, sort of checks on the system to make sure the current leaders are um, getting the job done in the way that the structure needs it done and the system needs it done. And I think, and I think the chairs and the leaders also probably self-check themselves as well. Um, some of the leadership positions have built in reviews, three-year reviews, five-year reviews. Um, we all have annual reviews at every level. And so I don't know that there's chair, there's limits per se, but I think, you know, I, I don't know if Rick Page is here as, you know, and I think at every step, everybody's sort of looking at the, the leaders and the, the junior folks coming up and trying to open up opportunities as many as they can. Um, some, some leaders have stayed around a very long time and should that be changed? I guess that's a open question, um, but I think at least there's an assessment of that the leadership is still of high quality, even if they are around. So I guess that's a start. I would just add that one of the things I did when I became chair is I noticed that many of the senior faculty had about six different titles or roles or you know jobs in the department. And, and one of the aspects that I've done is constantly asking people, when you're promoted, are there things that you could pass on to junior faculty that they could do to learn leadership step by step rather than just accumulating a lot of um, roles and titles? So we've done it you know, like almost a redistribution and a recalibrating of the, the roles that people have so that people uh, we try to have have a fewer number, a fewer number of roles. One of the things of the academic medical system is there are not term limits on chairs. Um, some places, as Beth said, there's like at University of Pennsylvania, when I was there, there was a uh, six or nine year review of chairs, um, but there was no um, time limit. Um, so that that's really something 
that academic medicine does not promote is limiting the amount of time. However, on the medical group board, on the health network board and committees, and there are term limits. So in leadership in the medical group and in, in the health network, um, if you volunteer to be on committees where you begin to learn systems and how they work, it's usually it's usually a three or four year term that can be renewed once, usually, if you're attending the meetings and doing what you're supposed to do. And, and then you rotate off. So it does create opportunities for new people to um, get onto committees. And that's another way of, of leading. And once you're on a committee, you could potentially become the vice chair or the chair of the committee. So there are other leadership opportunities from doing that. And there's a plug out right now, Jason, I'll put in a plug for a call for nominations for the medical group um, board and committees, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, just to uh, add to what you said, Deb, I think when folks get into the, you know, a little bit of higher level in their career, oftentimes they'll have multiple committees they're on. And I feel like at some point, for many purposes, the ins have to equal the outs. Like if you take something new on, you really should step away from things to open up for junior folks, to relieve yourself because it solves two problems because sometimes people can be very heavily weighted with service. And that's at some point doesn't serve their own growth needs and is also, you know, decreasing opportunities for junior faculty. So um, that's a really great way serving on a variety of committees to get to know how the institution works and how to start making your voice heard at various levels throughout the throughout the system. I just say I love the question. I think particularly for millennials, uh, we have to keep on doing better and engaging all ages on our teams and with leaders. My similar comment earlier, more leadership positions uh, makes making this happen now easier. I think as a leader, part of your job is to make your job go away uh, and, and to make uh, everyone on your team successful. And then hopefully other leaders recognize that, um, that solve the problem, that's great. There's a lot of problems in academic health systems, a lot of problems in the world. There's no lack of that as you as you solve one issue to go on to the next and develop a team around you who can move forward. And I think uh, particularly academically, if we look at our assistant professors and uh, the number of women faculty we have in assistant professors, that we have to get over the associate transition, really that cliff that still exists, associate the full professor. So now is the time to engage younger faculty uh, millennial, uh, millennials in our system, not too far long after Gen Z. And the last thing is just, we're in a bit of a bubble in healthcare uh, because we have such a commitment to our field long-term. But if you look in other industries uh, right now, earlier career generations are, are like saying, now is when we want things to change. Um, and the more that we can anticipate that in healthcare, um, we can get all the benefits that we have, including the longevity, but be receptive to our current time. But I can I just add two other points. One is if you want to move up as division chief, vice chair, chair, dean in that pathway, very often you have to move to move up. And for just studies have shown that it's harder for women to do that to their family than it is for men. Men will often justify it as if they are the, you know see themselves as the breadwinner for the family, they don't want to move. I mean, they'll justify moving because they can make more money, they can, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so very often for women, it's hard to move until your kids are out of school. And that can feel limiting. And so there is a way to recreate yourself where you are, but it's harder to do that than to look at other jobs um, outside of your institution. And I've now forgotten what my second point is, so I'll just be quiet. So we have, we have just a few minutes left, um, but I wanted to ask all of you for best piece of advice on leadership that you've ever gotten, worst piece of advice, throw it away. I wish I never heard that. Um, and. We'll start with whoever is ready. 
with a with a ready response for that. I see some there's some thoughts, there's some thinking going on. How about Jason? You want to go first? Sure. Uh, so uh, I think one good advice that stands out is one of my mentors. We're having a discussion similar to my points earlier, taking risks, solving problems, and he said, "Jason, I was already governor by your age. You know, just go forward." Uh, I think in terms of advice that uh, that wasn't as helpful, it's basically when people said, don't bother trying, like, you know, you wouldn't even be considered. Why would you even think about this, that that type of advice? And maybe maybe even the worst is like when you're just totally dismissed, like people kind of look at you oddly, like, why would you think about that versus like kind of saying, oh, well, you might, it might not work. Um, so that that advice I would recommend ignoring. Thank you. Beth? I just remember a couple of things people would say to me over the years that, you know, you know, they're valuable when they keep coming back to you. And I'll just, I don't know, these are the best pieces of advice. I could probably come up with more, you know, driving home tonight. But Rick Warren used to always say, <clears throat> the best battle plan doesn't survive the battle. And by that, he would, he means that, you know, you can plan all you want, but when real life happens, um, you got to be ready to be flexible. Um, and so I think I always remember that because it's really quite true. And and then Ben Lindbergh used to always say, um, it's easy when you know how to do it. And that seems sort of obvious, but things can be so, seem so, so hard when you really just have to spend some time and learn what you're doing and then it gets easier. And those I think are two sort of leadership statements I think that I continually come back to. So maybe I'll leave it with that. What about the worst advice? Uh, let me keep pondering on that. Okay. All right, Deborah. So I guess I guess there's like the advice I would give is a two-edged sword if you want to be a leader <laughs> um, is to be Teflon coated because you'll get a lot of feedback about what you're doing wrong um, as well as hopefully what you're doing right. But I, I would say that you can't and and the a corollary of that is that being a leader is not a popularity contest. Um, so sometimes it's hard to lead change. Um, I do think that knowing how to do change management well is not something I came into this position knowing, but something I've learned over time because the only constant thing in academic medicine is change, really. Um, and the fact that we take care of patients. But um, so the the worst advice um, was is similar to Jason's that I mean, I had one other chair, one chair when I was looking to become a chair, tell me that I was not chair material. And I might be chair of a C school. So when I became chair at University of Vermont, I saw him at a meeting and I said, you know, I'm a chair. And he said, yep, yeah. slapped me on the back and said, motivated you, didn't I? It's like, mm -hmm. that was really bad motivation. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was probably the worst advice. But, you know, just not listening to the people saying you can't if you really want to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... So I, I want to thank you so, so much um, for being here, but for being in our institution, for being the leaders that you are, for being mentors and sponsors um, for our faculty, our staff, and our students. I really appreciate each one of you. Um, and uh, we hope that folks will join us in person on December 13th to talk about everyday leaders. Um, Emily, if you could just throw that link in the chat, Qualtrics link, just put someone's name in it. Please just click the link. Let us know who in our institution needs to be honored for doing this leadership without the without having the title, who are everyday leaders. Um, I, as always, need to thank the COMAV team with Bruce, um, Bruce Kimball at the helm um, for leading us through this. Um, Emily, I'm Marino uh, for being the organizer of all of our events. Um, she does such a stellar job. Krista Kohler, thank you um, for supporting this as well. Um, Tiffany Delaney, the director of our office, uh, who uh, with whom I could not do any of this. Um, 
Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.